Yeah, we're going to look at hypertension and heart failure just to give an overview. So as usual, let's start off with uh, the definition. So high blood pressure or hypertension is defined as a sustained raise in blood pressure um, at least or greater than 140 systolic over 90 diastolic. And unfortunately, um, in terms of etiology, most of the cases would be primary or essential. So essentially what we're saying is that we don't really know the exact cause. And um, this is a majority of cases. And the rest of cases of secondary hypertension, uh, they can be divided very nicely um, as seen in your lecture using this uh, mnemonic R for renal or renovascular, where there is a renal hypoperfusion or stenosis. Uh, uh, giving rise to renin angiotensin system and uh, all the effects that come after that. And then there is endocrine. For example, in adrenal cortical or adrenal medullary tumors like veochromocytoma, um, there's neurologic high blood pressure, which is induced by increased raise, uh, by raised intracranial pressure, which then gives rise to a reflex increase in uh, systemic blood pressure. Uh, there can also be aortic causes, such as aortic coarctation or anything that increases the stiffness of the aorta. And then L stands for labile, where blood pressure can be raised uh, in the setting of psychological stress. Now, in terms of clinical manifestation, uh, most of the time hy hypertension is asymptomatic. Uh, however, it can wreak a lot of damage uh, on multiple organs. So this is why patients must always be counseled to take their medication, even though they feel well. Now, what sort of pathology can we expect? Uh, this can affect many organs, and they often start at the level of the blood vessels, whether they are smaller or larger. So for larger blood vessels, there can be accelerated atherosclerosis. Hypertension is one of the modifiable risk factors for atherosclerosis, if you recall, that we talked about here. Um, it can also predispose to aneurysm formation. In the smaller blood vessels, such as the arterioles, uh, we get what we call arterial low sclerosis, which can be in two forms, uh, the more benign form, which is uh, highlight arterial low sclerosis, or the more um, dangerous form, which is hyperplastic arterial sclerosis. And that's where this can lead to actually uh, damage the vessel and even fibrinoid necrosis in the wall of the vessel. Now, smaller vessels can also be prone to aneurysm formation. For example, in some of the cerebral vessels in the brain, uh, these vessels are prone to rupture. This is why spontaneous hemorrhage in the brain in hypertensives can occur and give rise to sudden neurologic deficits or what we call strokes. Now, of course, hypertension can also give rise to cardiac effects, and this is known as hypertensive heart disease. One of the more uh, important and prominent effects would be left ventricular hypertrophy due to increased pressure load and this can eventually give rise to left ventricular failure and go on to congestive heart failure. We'll talk a bit more about heart failure later. Um, some of the very important uh, end organs that are affected in hypertension include the kidney as well as the brain. In the kidney, when we have these uh, vascular changes, um, the highline type arterial sclerosis, this is called nephrosclerosis. Of course, there can also be hyperplastic arterial sclerosis in the kidney, and this is seen in malignant hypertension and can lead to renal failure. Um, in the brain, as mentioned, there can be hemorrhage from small little aneurysms, and there can also be uh, thrombosis. So malignant hypertension, I touched on. Um, this is where there are severe effects affecting uh, main organs like the brain, giving rise to encephalopathy, uh, renal, uh, renal failure, as well as heart failure. And last but not least, let's touch on heart failure. Heart failure is a condition where the heart is not able to meet the body's metabolic demands. And this is usually seen uh, despite normal or raised venous filling pressure. So it is not due to severe uh, uh, hemorrhage leading to depletion in blood volume. Now we can look at heart failure in terms of forward failure as well as backward failure. Uh, in forward failure, what it means is that heart is not pumping well, therefore there is decreased cardiac output. Whereas in backward failure, the chamber that is receiving the blood and moving it forward is not working properly. 
and this results in venous congestion. When you have a combination of heart failure involving both sides of the heart, left and right, this is known as congestive cardiac failure. And um, this is one of the end stages of many of the different types of cardiovascular diseases and can eventually uh, result in cardiogenic shock. So heart failure occurs when all the compensatory mechanisms uh, are no longer able to maintain cardiac output and we have certain compensatory mechanisms such as increased heart rate, uh, ventricular hypertrophy, cardiac dilation in an attempt to increase uh, output as well as uh, water and salt retention by the kidneys. Uh, now, the causes of heart failure are much to do with uh, the four elements that we mentioned earlier on that are required for the heart to pump properly or to function properly as a systemic pump for the circulation. So conditions that we have previously touched on, ischemic heart disease, myocarditis, cardiomyopathies, etc. can affect the pump. And we also previously mentioned some of the conducting uh, abnormalities or conduction abnormalities. Now, in terms of the valves, um, you can sort of think about uh, valvular disease um, in two functional aspects. One is when the valve is incompetent, meaning it's not able to close properly. And this allows a backflow of blood. This is called regurgitation, for example, mitral regurgitation. And this results in a volume overload in the chamber where the blood is supposed to be leaving. And this then results in the dilatation of the cardiac chamber as well as hypertrophy. Eventually can give rise to failure. The other thing that can go wrong with valves, of course, is that they can't open properly. And this is known as stenosis. So the lumen is the opening is narrowed. And this results in a pressure overload. And again, this has got effects on the chamber, which is often that of hypertrophy. And after a certain point where the heart can no longer compensate, this is when um, heart failure ensues. Now, another very important cause of heart failure is hypertension, which I will just put here separately. as one of the commonest causes of uh, congestive cardiac failure. So if we were to try to dissect out the clinical signs and symptoms of heart failure, it would probably be best to divide it into left heart failure and right heart failure. Uh, you can actually work out the causes by going through these little elements here that we can see. And of course, there are other things that can cause left heart failure, for example, constrictive pericarditis. So this is not an exhaustive uh, list. Now, clinically, looking at the manifestations uh, of uh, left heart failure, um, if we think about backward failure, uh, pathophysiology, the physiology part is very important. We know that the left heart actually receives blood from the lungs. So if there's backward failure, there will be blood that gets stuck in the lungs. In other words, giving rise to pulmonary congestion and pulmonary edema. Now, this in turn will affect gas exchange and cause the patient to experience shortness of breath, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, as well as orthopnea. And you can read up more about these terms uh, on your own. The patients may also have a cough, which may produce some amount of a frothy, blood-tinged sputum, and also experience fatigue. Now, for forward failure, because the left heart essentially supplies blood to every part of the body, there can be resulting uh, effects such as uh, those arising from renal hypoperfusion. When there is less blood going to the kidneys, uh, they will then activate the renin-angiotensin system and give rise to salt and water retention. Uh, there can also be cerebral hypoxia and ensuing clinical signs and symptoms. Now, when it comes to right heart failure, one of the most important causes is actually left heart failure, eventually giving rise to stress on the right heart and causing right heart failure. Um, in addition, chronic lung parenchymal disease, uh, such as that seen in smokers, for example, uh, emphysema can also give rise to right heart failure because it can induce pulmonary hypertension. Uh, of course, there can be many other causes including valvular diseases and some of these uh, causes here as well. Now, in right heart failure, the predominant um, pathophysiology is that of venous congestion. So, the clinical signs and symptoms arise from this and 
what happens is that in the abdominal organs, because the inferior vena cava receives the venous return from these organs, large organs such as liver and spleen, there can be ensuing hepatosplenomegaly on clinical examination. There can also be body cavity effusions, um, such as peritoneal effusion called ascites. And uh, what is most visible to the patient perhaps is uh, peripheral edema. So the patient may complain of lower limb swelling. And these patients may also experience nocturia, which is the need to urinate during the night. And this is often because all the fluid that was retained um, in the third compartment will return to the kidneys and be excreted uh, at night when the patient is uh, lying down. So essentially, we have gone through uh, the main cardiovascular conditions or diseases uh, that you will encounter relatively frequently. Of course, there's a whole host of others that are not covered here, but hopefully this will give you a good overview of some of these conditions. And we've talked about them in terms of the definitions, uh, the etiology and the clinical effects, as well as some of the risk factors.